Millions of Nigerian Christians have been forced to flee their homes by the ISIS-inspired terrorist group Boko Haram. But they're not giving up their faith or their dreams for the future. CBN contributor Chuck Holton visited a refugee camp near Abuja to find Christians who are holding on to hope and prayer despite their desperate conditions. It's Sunday morning in Nigeria, and Christians across the country are heading to church. As part of the continent's largest Christian community, most believers here have their choice of places to worship. Here at the Family Worship Center, pastored by a graduate of Regent University, thousands lift their hands in praise. But just a few miles away on this Sunday, these people try to find enough food to survive another day. I'm just outside of Abuja in the capital of Nigeria, and this is a refugee camp with about 1,500 people in it that have been internally displaced from their villages further north and to the west. There are about two and a half million internally displaced people within Nigeria, and that makes this one of the largest humanitarian crises in the world right now. And the thing that all of these people have in common is that they're Christians. 29-year-old Aisha grew up in northern Kenya with her family, scratching out a meager living along with the rest of those in her small village. She's a Christian from one of the largest ethnic groups in West Africa. Life was hard for this young mother, and it was about to get a whole lot harder. In November 2013, Boko Haram invaded our village. They killed my father-in-law and abducted some of the children who lived with us. We were so scared, so we fled to the mountains. As a movement, Boko Haram has been around for a very long time, starting back in 2002, long before ISIS even became a thing. And as time went on, they got more and more extreme to the point where, in 2011, they detonated a car bomb at this building behind me. That's the UN embassy here in Abuja. They've continued to kill people across the country of Nigeria, thousands in fact, to the point where in 2015, they were dubbed the most dangerous terror group on the planet. Much of that terror directed at Christians. Enoch Yohana was one of Aisha's neighbors. They started with burning of the churches, killing the pastors and uh, killing the members, closing them down. On 29 September 2014 was the day that they attacked uh, my village. Uh, around uh, 10, I, I have a call that they have killed my dad. They asked him to deny Christ, in which he refused. They have caught his uh, right hands. Then uh, he refused. They have caught to the elbow again, in which he refused before they shot him thrice. Uh, at the head, uh, forehead, the neck and chest. Many of the 1,500 Christians living in this camp have similar stories, like Hanatu, who had to flee on foot across the border into Cameroon, carrying her three-year-old daughter on her back. Okay, we escaped from Boko Haram. I walked for two months before I reached Nigeria. Once she arrived, she realized the camp had no school for the children, so she decided to do something about it. The thing has tortured my mind that these children, they are living like that without going to school. We sit down, we discuss and say, how are we going to do with this life of these children? Are we going to leave them like this? This Boko Haram is because of illiteracy that they start killing everybody. So if we didn't teach these children, they will affect us directly or indirectly. Now I thank God, the children now, we have seen a great change. Hanatu and other volunteers go beyond reading and arithmetic, also teaching the children about their heritage, since many of these little ones have never seen their true homes. We always cry, uh, there is a, a song that our children always sing, oh my home, oh my home, because there is no place like home. It's been raining all night long and you know, the polyethylene on the tops of these shacks here gets leaky very quickly. One of the hardest things about living here is the leaky roofs during the rainy season because water constantly drips onto our bed. We depend on people to feed us, so when they are unable to give us food, we go hungry.
The Nigerian military has mounted large offensives against Boko Haram in recent months. And even with heavy losses on both sides, there seems to be no end in sight. Despite the hardships, these displaced Christians are firm believers in the power of prayer. My faith has helped my prayer life, and I believe the prayers of the other saints around the world have helped us to get through this hard time. My desire is for God to restore all those who have been displaced and allow us to go back to our homes so that we can worship God together and live in peace. Iran is warning the U.S. not to retake a seized super tanker released overnight. Gibraltar rejected an American appeal to detain the Iranian vessel longer. It is allegedly carrying sanctioned crude oil and heading towards Greece. MTS Tayyab is in Tehran with a look at the impact of international sanctions on Iran. MTS, good morning. Good morning. Iran is still holding on to a British oil tanker and is apparently trying to get around U.S. sanctions. Now, in his first ever interview with an American TV network, a top member of Iran's elite Revolutionary Guard bluntly criticized U.S. actions. Trump. Hussein Dagan says the U.S. is behaving like pirates and called President Trump a gangster. Tough talk from Iran's powerful Revolutionary Guard. But there's another sanctions battle being fought in Iran, this time at a children's hospital, where it's every parent's worst nightmare. Learning your child's cancer has come back. Adding to the agony, the cocktail of drugs four-year-old Mahdi needs to stay alive simply isn't available. His mom tells me Mahdi is her only child. The most doctors can do for him now is keep him comfortable. Iran produces most of its own pharmaceuticals, but when it comes to the most advanced medicines, it relies heavily on imports, and that's how sanctions can have an effect. Technically, medicines are exempt from U.S. sanctions, but the financial transactions to purchase them on the global marketplace are not. Imports have dropped by 80 percent. Are people losing their lives because they can't get this drug? Yes. What do you say to a parent whose child has cancer, that the drug is available outside of Iran, but you can't bring it into Iran. What do you say to them? I just uh, tell them to pray and uh, be sure that uh, we are with you. Uh, we know your pain. Doctors don't know exactly how many children have died because of this inability to bring in medicine. But as the CEO of the charity told us, with 80% fewer drugs coming in, you only have to do the math. North Korea and China have reaffirmed their traditional friendship in a series of talks between their top military officials. The talks in Beijing came hot on the heels of the regime's latest missile tests. Experts say Pyongyang is using these uh, missile launches to show its discontent over the ongoing military drills between Seoul and Washington. Lee Sung Jae with the details. On Saturday, Kim Sugil, the director of General Political Bureau of the Korean People's Army, held talks in Beijing with Zhang Yuxia, the chairman of China's Central Military Commission. According to China's state-run Xinhua News Agency, the meeting highlighted the traditional friendship between North Korea and China. It said China is willing to work with the North to strengthen communication and promote cooperation and mutual support so as to contribute to the consolidation and development of bilateral relations and regional peace and stability. In response, North Korea's state-run Korean Central News Agency reported that Kim soo gil said Pyongyang is also ready to strengthen friendly exchanges between the two armed forces in various fields and mutual learning and promote the relations between the two countries and the two armed forces to a higher level. The high-level talks came after Kim soo gil also held talks with Mia Hua, the director of the Political Affairs Department of China's Central Military Commission. Experts say China may be why the North has been strongly responding to the scaled-down joint military exercises between Seoul and Washington. I want to say carefully that North Korea has called for an end to the South Korea-U.S. combined military exercise as a result of coordination with China. Other experts say the aggressive response to the drills could negatively affect future nuclear negotiations between Pyongyang and Washington.
The two sides have yet to hold the working level talks their leaders promised when they met at the DMZ in June. Iran appears to be preparing another satellite launch according to fresh satellite images of the Imam Khomeini Space Center. The images show increased activity at the Space Center, including around the launch pad. In July, Iran's communications minister said Tehran was planning three more launches. The United States insists such launches defy a UN Security Council resolution urging Iran not to undertake activity related to ballistic missiles capable of delivering nuclear weapons. Iran says the satellite launches have no military connection. International security analyst Martin Himmel joins us now in the studio. Martin, the United States says this is a violation of UN resolutions. Iran says there is no military connection here at all, and that resolution isn't binding anyway. Should the West be concerned by this attempt to launch satellites? Yes, it should, because all these efforts uh, point to an attempt to try to uh, expand, perfect, and promote uh, ballistic missiles. If you're going to launch a nuclear missile at, a, at uh, Israel... God forbid. Yes. It's going to have to go through outer space to some degree uh, in order to come this way or to Europe or anywhere else. So is that concerned that the satellite program is actually a cover for other mil military activities? It could be both. It could be for communications. And, and by perfecting the ability to send a communication satellite in, in space, you're also perfecting the ability to send a nuclear weapon through space. And so that's the big concern here. And it's another attempt to ratchet up the tension that's going on, this chess game tension between uh, Iran and the United States. And what do we understand specifically? about what Iran wants to use its satellite program for. Is that satellite program in itself a threat to Western security? It says that the program is for satellite communication. Uh, they've made two previous attempted launches uh, to try to put satellites into orbit recently, and that failed. And uh, they're obviously trying to perfect the ability to put a satellite uh, into or communication satellite into orbit. It could also be used for spy, could be used for a lot of things. But uh, the most important thing is if, if you perfect a ballistic missile to put a satellite in space, you're perfecting a ballistic missile to launch a nuclear weapon, and that's the big concern. We start in Afghanistan, where a joyous celebration descended into horror after a suicide bomber targeted a wedding. It happened in Kabul. At least 63 people, including children, were killed. Nearly 200 others were hurt. Ian Lee reports. It's a sight that's become all too common in Afghanistan. Rows of fresh graves holding the victims of the country's latest attack. This time, a suicide bomber targeted a wedding, killing dozens of people and wounding scores more. I heard an explosion, and it was very horrific, said this man. A lot of guests were killed. The attack took place at this wedding hall west of the city, mostly populated by Shiite Muslims. ISIS, which typically targets Shiites, has claimed responsibility. Eyewitnesses say the bomber walked among the children dancing before detonating. The carnage was so great that some bodies couldn't be identified. Their shoes are all that remain. Afghanistan's president, Ashraf Ghani, condemned the bombing, saying, the targeting of our people in such events indicates the atrocity of a terrorist group who is determined to kill innocent people. Even the Taliban condemned the attack. But ISIS, after losing their so-called caliphate in Iraq and Syria, look to exploit the chaos in Afghanistan in order to spread their reign of terror. Mohammed Sadiq may never regain his vision in one of his eyes. He says he was hit by pellets fired by an Indian soldier right after he stepped out of his local mosque. Everything was normal. There were no protests. Security forces chased us away and fired pellets at us. One more person older than me was also injured. He was discharged from hospital yesterday. Mohammed accuses security forces in Indian administered Kashmir of targeting Kashmiris. He shows us his back with scars off what he says are pellet injuries. Earlier this month, thousands here defied restrictions imposed by the authorities and protested against the Indian government's decision to revoke Kashmir's autonomy. This 17-year-old was one of them. We had no intentions to pelt stones, but the police attacked us, and several boys were injured, including me. I was hit on the right side of my body by pellet. Even though Indian-administered Kashmir has been under lockdown for nearly two weeks, people have come out in protest. In some cases, the government has responded with force, even admitting that a few people have been injured in the recent crisis.
In 2016, the Indian government said it would replace pellet guns with a less lethal weapon. But on the ground, in Indian administered Kashmir, security forces are still using them against those protesting over New Delhi's decision to revoke Kashmir's autonomy. It was a wet and very wild weekend for a lot of people. Severe storms hitting the Midwest all the way right here to the Northeast, bringing dangerous winds, rain, and flash flooding. We're getting those alerts on our phone yeah. all through the early evening. Kept here. going off all night. And that threat, unfortunately, is not over. Gio Benita starts us off in Pennsylvania, where that lightning strike sent a tree crashing into a tent full of people, severely injuring some of them. Good morning, Gio. Yes, Cecilia, good morning to you. It was just after 5 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon at this popular swim club when lightning struck, causing havoc and serious injuries. A summer day at this Pennsylvania swim club taking a sudden and severe turn. Traumatic injuries often in the swim club. Mass casual incident. Lightning striking this tree, sending it falling onto a tent, two adults and seven children injured. There was three serious injuries and the rest were minor. The back injury and two head injuries. This dangerous end to a summer Sunday coming after a weekend of wild weather across the country. North of Pittsburgh, these patrons taking cover after a microburst tore through this outdoor brewery, trees and power lines swinging violently. Firefighters working around the clock. This is one of the worst I've ever seen. We're just glad there was no casualties. The storms leaving thousands without power. In Kansas, a lightning packed storm, a strike causing this house fire in Overland Park, and winds of more than 70 miles per hour to blame for derailing dozens of cars on this train in Walton. In South Carolina, this man nearly struck by lightning, speaking out this morning about his close call. Out of a sudden, I hear this loud boom and crack. Seemed like a little flashing. Umbrella jumped out my hand and it scared the heck out of me. Tree after tree captured on camera toppling over. This one on a car and this one on a mobile home. One person seriously hurt. In Durham, heavy rains causing a 50 car pileup. Extreme weather hit a wide swath of the country all weekend. This lightning storm in Kansas forced drivers to pull off the road as winds hit over 60 miles an hour. About 100 miles away, strong gusts toppled some 140 train cars. The derailment blocked over a mile of track. Further east in Pennsylvania, a microburst tore through the town of Lawrenceville, toppling trees and knocking out power for hundreds of customers. Two buildings were damaged, including one owned by Jimmy Cohen. I'm shocked. I mean, I'm totally shocked. Winds also took down trees in Wisconsin. I never seen anything like this. As lightning cracked through the trunk of this tree in Illinois. And it was really bright, and all you, all you saw was a cloud of white smoke coming out of here. A guard of honor for a soldier killed in the floods. After days of heavy rain, a landslide wiped out much of the village in Kavalapara. Among the homes destroyed was Vishnu's. <laughs> Vishnu, who was with the Indian Army, his entire family is no more. All the bodies were recovered except his mother and sister's body, and the search is ongoing. He was just one of more than 200 people who died after the country was hit by heavy monsoon rains, large-scale flooding, and scores of landslides. As the flood waters recede, rescue teams move in with radars to search for bodies buried deep in the mud. With the help of radars, we just found three bodies. We now have 16 more to find out of the 59 people killed here. We will continue our search operation until the last body is taken out. Last year, southern India suffered its worst flooding in a century. A million people were displaced. Villages swept away. More than 200 people killed. Kerala has more than 50 large dams which are supposed to protect areas against flooding. But the UN says many were nearly full before the heavy rains fell. Local officials say they've taken action. As aid workers start cleaning up and people return, more rain is expected, threatening many of the most vulnerable with more hardship. An avowed white nationalist is expected to be arraigned later today in Ohio after allegedly plotting a mass shooting against Jews. His name is James Reardon. He is 20 years old. At least two more alleged shooting plots in other states have been broken up in the past week. Tristan Wicks was arrested in Florida, and Brandon Wagshaw was picked up in Connecticut. Meg Oliver is here with a look at how social media played a role. Meg, what do we know?
Good morning, Gail. Authorities say all of these suspects shared their plans either online or with other people. Their conversations and social media posts eventually got to the police. But according to the FBI, as these types of threats rise, they are not always reported in time. <laughs> James Reardon allegedly posted this disturbing video on Instagram in July, showing him firing a semi-automatic rifle over the sound of people screaming. The caption appeared to foreshadow plans to attack a local Jewish community center. After an investigation by Ohio police, FBI agents raided Reardon's home on Friday, uncovering semi-automatic weapons, ammunition, a gas mask, and bulletproof armor. A day later, police arrested him. Several states away, police on Friday arrested 25-year-old Tristan Wicks in a Florida grocery store parking lot, reportedly after a tip from his ex-girlfriend. In an August 11th text message to her, Wicks allegedly wrote, a school is a weak target. I'd be more likely to open fire on a large crowd of people from over three miles away. A good 100 kills would be nice. I already have a location. In Connecticut Friday, Brandon Wagshall appeared in court after his arrest for illegal possession of large-capacity magazines. Police claim Wagshall expressed interest in committing mass shootings on Facebook, but his lawyer says that is not Wagshall's intention. An FBI study shows more than 50% of active shooters share their plans beforehand, but those critical warning signs are reported to law enforcement less than half the time. Are copycat crimes becoming a competitive sport? Yes, actually they are. CBS News security analyst Paul Violas is urging people to speak up if they see threats online. We can turn this around with respect to our active shooters, but if we don't, if we don't, we're going to be back here probably in the next week or so, if not less.